Hi, everyone. This is Samira Daswani here, the host of the podcast, The Patient from Hell. Today, I have um, the opportunity to have a guest on here that I'm incredibly excited about. His name is Jeff Stewart. I'm going to let him introduce himself, but the one teaser I'll give you is he is a polymath. So he's someone who knows a lot about a lot of things. So I am very excited about unpacking a whole host of themes with Jeff today. Um, Jeff, thank you for coming on to our show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Jeff, so can you tell us what makes you a polymath? Oh, my. <laughs> well, with a setup like that, I, it, it makes me, it puts me in the uncomfortable position of bragging about myself. But if I'm That's bragging cool. about myself, then um, the thing that most people that know me know me about uh, uh, would know me from winning on Jeopardy. Now, this is many years ago. This is, uh, God, it's almost, gosh, it's almost 30 years ago that, that I won the college tournament and got second on the tournament of champions. Um, and so there, there was one time in my life that I was recognized everywhere. I, I didn't matter what part of the world I was in, I would get people calling out my name, uh, which is a weird feeling, but an interesting feeling. That hasn't continued throughout the rest of my life. Um, I'm a managing director um, at a life sciences company, a, a large one, um, where I consult for pharma companies. I had to do a, um, I had to do a conflict resolution with, um, with uh, ASCO, the, um, the American Society for Clinical Oncology for an article that will be coming out shortly with them. And the list was long. I've done 300 projects um, cool. over the last 15 years, um, now almost 16 years with pharma companies um, and helping them make their decisions. And um, there, it, it's been a lot of them. So names that you would have heard of sometimes on cancer, not always on cancer. Um, my, um, uh, my background is molecular biology. I have an MBA, um, at, similar to yours, uh, where you, you took science and, um, and business information and worked in consulting. That's what I've been doing for the, for the past um, you know, decade plus. Um, and then I think the other part, which I think you're uh, kind of alluding to is that I've, uh, I've written a fair amount, um, uh, wrote plays, um, and, uh, then more recently wrote a book about called living inspiration from a father with cancer because I got cancer. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm incredibly sorry you got cancer, but I'm also uh, glad to have you join the club that nobody wants to belong to. That unfortunately I belong to as well. So this club that we have exclusive membership to um, actually makes us cross paths with some phenomenal individuals. So I'm super glad that our paths have crossed and I get to learn from you and listen to your story and see kind of how the many things that you've had in life kind of start to intersect. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to dive straight into the deep end. Um, so in preparing for this podcast, I was listening to some of uh, your work and I there was one thing you said that really resonated. You said something, uh, which I'm going to botch by the way, but you said something like, I live between uh, living like I'm living for five months or I might mm -hmm. live for 50 years and I have to plan for everything in the middle. Can you talk to us a bit about how that came about? Sure. What do you mean by so, that? So my particular cancer, this is not going to be generalizable to all cancer patients, but for my particular cancer, the risk is front loaded. If it's lethal, it's lethal very quickly. So I have a particular kind of cancer called a gastric adenocarcinoma, um, diffuse type, meaning that the, the cancer kind of infiltrates and replaces the organ as it goes and doesn't show up as tumors until late in the game. So it tends to spread pretty rapidly. And then all of a sudden you see it finally, um, or you you catch it, if you catch it um, symptomatically um, before then, it has a poor prognosis. Um, if it gets to be metastatic, um, the, for the very particular kind I have, the average um, life, uh, the average life expectancy is uh, between five and six months. Um, if it progresses. Um, on the other hand, Roughly speaking, there's a 50% chance that I am already cured, that what they have done, um, you know, a combination of chemo, chemo and radiation, um, and surgery, that, that that combination has already cured me. So I can be sitting here right now with a completely normal lifespan in, in front of me. And yeah. it's not, I don't know about you, Samira, but I, I used to think of my life 
maybe in five year chunks, 10 year chunks, maybe where I might change a job or think about how I might mm -hmm. invest a certain amount of time, not everything, but a certain amount of time for that future. And that's gone now. Now my investment has to work for the next five months and has to work for the next 50 years, which is, um, it's just a, a, a strange place to be. Uh, can we, can we dive into the stats really quickly? Because I think it's an <laughs> area that, um, I think you and I may have the privilege of understanding statistics, especially when it comes to overall survival, progression, free survival, curative intent, non-curative mm -hmm. intent. Um, can you talk a bit about how you managed to do the math on you have a 50% chance of actually being cured? Sure. So the, let's take the, let's take the bad side of it first. Mm -hmm. okay, how do we, how do I know it's lethal? This it turns out to be pretty easy. The, uh, the National Health Services of England puts the five-year survival at gastric adenocarcinoma with something that's more or less a quote that says, sadly, there is no five-year survival for this cancer because essentially everybody dies of it within five years. Um, there are papers also out there with my particular mutational set that put numbers on how many months it is um, mm -hmm. on average. So I, I have that piece of information. There are complicated pieces that make it really hard to figure out exactly what my odds are of surviving. So I, I'm looking at several pieces of information. And the reason that it's unusual or difficult to figure out is a, there are a couple of reasons. One is they're mixed populations. Either it's a mixed population of people that have diffuse type, uh, mm -hmm. gastric adenocarcinoma, and intestinal type, which is just another type of it that mm -hmm. that just they act differently, but they get mixed together in the statistics. So I have the worst one. So whatever numbers are out there, I'm probably on the worst side of the mm -hmm. range. And um, uh, on the other hand, uh, you, I, I live just down, you know, just down the road from Duke. Um, I have excellent supportive care. I, I have no particular mm -hmm. problem maintaining something like um, uh, uh, compliance with my mm -hmm. drug medications. I take my drugs, I take them on time. Um, and uh, so that puts me at a better risk profile. The, um, the numbers, because I had surgery first, because they didn't, they didn't realize that I had this kind of cancer. Um, they, they couldn't. So let, let me just, let me just rush to say that um, they didn't do the wrong thing, because they were being stupid. They did the wrong thing, because they didn't, know that it was a diffuse type gastric adenocarcinoma. They thought it was a different type called a GIST tumor, a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, which has better outcomes. You treat it surgically first, then you take a targeted chemotherapy. Once they only after they removed and after pathology came back, they say, oh, uh, well, not only is it one type that's bad, we should have just put you on chemo at the beginning. And we didn't take out enough lymph nodes. So we don't really know your status. So I'm kind of like in this, mm -hmm. I guess you call it a liminal space where you're just trying to decide, like, am I am I really stage 2A? Am I stage 3? I don't, I don't know. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I'm one of those two. So you kind of have to balance it. And um, and the the most of the numbers are based off of people that have, and this is a term that gets thrown about a lot, you can have adjuvant therapy or neoadjuvant therapy, adjuvant therapy, meaning that you got, you, uh, you got, uh, your, uh, I have to think through this again. So, uh, neoadjuvant therapy means you got the treatment before you got surgery. your surgery. That's normal. I didn't get that. I got for my cancer, I got adjuvant therapy, which means I got surgery first and then yeah. chemo. So now it limits which particular five-year survival I need to look at. And it's a mix between, in those ones, it's a mix between people that had stage two and stage three. But what yeah. do I have? I don't even really know what I have for sure. In something that some, some had stage four kind of mixed in there. So it's all very mushy. And then this is something where I'm putting my own like guess on top of it is because I have a particular mutation that's yeah. called the FGFR2 mutation. Mm. That one is associated with faster death. Mm. Is it like three months faster? Yeah. But does that mean it's more likely death? Mm. Maybe, 
and so all of these fuzzy numbers get me to something like 50%, but that's as close as anybody seems to be able to get is yeah, it's about right. Maybe it's two thirds chance of surviving. Maybe it's 50%. Maybe it's one third. Not sure. So that, uh, I'm sorry. That's a long talk through just the, the it's, no. it's uh, interesting and complicated in a boring way because it's not, not everybody has this. Sometimes it's very clear cut. So the funny thing is, I don't think it's boring at all. Uh, I can tell you that I run my own math, and it's nowhere mm -hmm. as uh, dire. I think I think the results of my case, because I had relatively early stage breast cancer, mm -hmm. prognosis is good. The math actually is favorable. But I, like you, like data and needed to find certainty, at least the certainty I could possibly find through the analysis. And, of course, the specific... Um, data sets and papers I was reading were different. It was a very similar uh, process, which is partly why I was asking you to talk about it, because I suspect that many, many, many patients and families out there are doing what we are talking about, mm -hmm. but we don't have the tools to do it, right? Because there is this like mishmash of data because it's not clean data. Trials are not done on our exact subtypes. In my case, it was not Early stage was done, but most trials enroll postmenopausal women. I'm premenopausal. If you look at the outcomes cut by age, the outcomes are very different for young women than old women, right? So there's mm. different dimensions that play out into calculating risk. But the thing is that that's how clinicians talk about it. But I began to realize I had to like go back to like high school math and remember basic statistics to understand risk. So I'd love, I'd love for us to talk a little bit more about that, because I think that relates to another theme that I know you spend a lot of time talking about, which is misinformation. Mm. And how can someone who is not as privileged as you and me, who doesn't have a science background, who doesn't know how to read papers, they, they are grappling with the exact same topics that we're talking about, right? So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about one, how you've come to think of risk, right? Because mm. you, I've heard a couple of frameworks, right? Five months, five, 50 years, you've calculated odds, you've calculated best case odds, worst case odds, you also have ranges in mind based on what scenarios play out. So how are you thinking about risk and how does that influence your decisions on a day-to-day -day basis? So I, I think if I'm kind of also just push it, pushing it towards the what should a patient do? Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, if if you are not familiar with statistics, if you don't know, if if I did, if you were asked where do you find good quality papers and you don't know immediately to go to PubMed, yes, which is the vast majority of people, mm -hmm. you, you don't have a molecular biology degree or mm -hmm. a biomedical engineering degree. Uh, th th you're not trained in this. There is a simple answer to all of this stuff, which is going to sound terrible, but is true. Trust your oncologist. That is what they do. They went to school for four years in college. They went for four more years in medical school and four to seven years of residency. They are science nerds for the most part. This is their job and they do this. For all the work that I did, uh, that I brought to my own, um, my own cancer, yeah. I don't know that I got much out of that, that changed my odds or yeah. ma made me in a better position. Yeah. I just, I, I couldn't, I wasn't going to turn it off yeah. and, you know, not figure stuff out because figuring stuff out is Thursday for me uh, in this field, you know, so wh why not do that? Of course I'm going to do that. But then at a certain point you go, okay, well, you know, that's uh, like, there, there are some things that I'm going to think that are um, stupid that, um, I don't know how stupid I am and I just have to have the oncologist kind of laugh at me and, and tell me I'm, I'm being a little bit stupid and that's fine. We can all just benefit from the um, education and the work that our oncologists have done and get 90%, 100% of what we would ever get from if we, we went there ourselves and we stop introducing the risk that we just don't get something that we yeah. are being stupid about something. It's it's similar actually. So I, you know, I did a fair amount of stock analysis um, as part of my graduate work. Um, and um, understanding at the end of the day, what is the best way to analyze and go and pick stocks is 
to pay the lowest fees and don't pick stocks. Go with an index fund and yeah. just, you know, don't like trust that the system is probably better than you are because, or paying someone else who has yeah. fees to make decisions for you in the casino. I mean, that's just, the, the, it turns out that pretty boring things of trusting experts to be experts is usually a better choice than trying to be an expert yourself. The, mm -hmm. the, I think probably the key Samira, which um, is not going to be, you didn't run into this probably as much as, uh, uh, as most people, I didn't run into this as much as most people, but most people will run into this is your oncologist is trying to figure out how much you can take. How yes. much information can you take? Do you yeah. really want it straight? Do they have to be a counselor to you and hide from you the information that you need to be able to understand these things? If you're going to ask, um, I mean, even my oncologist by the end, after, you know, after having <laughs> endured me <laughs> for a year, um, for nearly a year on this stuff, um, it was like, well, uh, if, uh, when I ask straight, I'm like, okay, so there are these new drugs that are out that are just just coming out, probably will be approved this year for um, for gastric cancer. These are the anti-cloud and 18.2 drugs. So these are just like new class, yeah. you know, exciting. As far as I can tell, doctor, they add three months of life on average, but do not have truly, uh, they're, they're not going to be curative. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're right, Jeff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that that I, I, mean, I always like to say there's hope, but you're right. That so they they're they're kind of caught in that place. So we as patients have to give our oncologist permission to tell it to us straight before they can feel comfortable telling it to us straight. So that's the other thing that we can do, not just listen to our oncologist, but relieve our oncologists of the need to be our um, counselors. Uh, I think that helps them to do their job. I love that. So I, I love where you just went with this because I, I, I'll tell you where I was going to go with this and then I'll tell you why I don't think we should spend time on it. Where I was going to go with it is I was going to push back on you a little bit. Not that we shouldn't trust our oncologists, but our oncologists have limited time. I mean, most oncologists have what? The average is 24 minutes with a patient. And in 24 minutes, we're going through treatment decisions, supportive care, presumably you're not alone in the appointment. So there's family members with you or community members with you. So there's talking to them. There's explaining what's next. There's explaining how to manage everything at home. In 24 minutes, an oncologist simply doesn't have the time to teach you basic stats. They just don't. It's just, it's not, the system's not set up for it. So the reason I was going to push back a little bit is because I do think, like I was just reading a paper recently, that 97% of cancer patients resort to Google. And with open notes where you as a patient legally get access to your report before your oncologist has even seen it, means that you are looking at a report of a scan written for a technical scientist, medical clinician, but you are getting access to that information prior to your oncologist even seeing it. Which means now, for good or bad, if my report scan comes out, I am definitely looking at that thing. I am definitely gonna be reading that. There's no universe which I'm not reading that. That takes a lot of constraint and emotional uh, rule following that I honestly just have. I, Nope, if it reports out, I'm reading that thing. But if I'm reading that thing, I I don't I'm a bioengineer. I, I don't know how to interpret a radiation radiologist scan. I, I'm not a clinician. But I'm I end up resorting to Google, right? So it's this funny balance of yes, I need to trust the system, but the system system is not really set up for it. So there is this like funny, funny world that we end up navigating on the medical information side, where we as a community have been given agency because of open notes, because of Google, this is democratization of information, but we don't have the tools to actually understand it. Right? That's so fair. Funny, funny balance in there. And I think if I were 
teaching someone who wanted to know one step further, and maybe you'd have the same reaction, is I'd be looking at two things overall. So, or you, you have to know the stage and the type of your drug. If you don't have the stage of your drug and the type, or sorry, type of the drug, type of the cancer, mm -hmm. Um, okay. Then, gotcha. yeah, well, the chemo brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's uh, brain. You're good. You're good right. on this podcast. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so if you don't know the type of your cancer, the the right technical term to look it up, and if you don't know the stage of it, you don't really know much of much. You need to know those things. And then you need to know how the, the system has evolved to... Um, uh, the, the scholars have evolved to describe your risk. So it's a weird one. It's, it's, um, it, it, imagine if in your car you were driving and you didn't have a gas tank telling you how much life you have left. That does not exist for cancer. What exists is something telling you if you drive for five hours, five years in this case, how likely are you to run out of gas? So that five-year survival is the, it's the coin of the realm. It's the way that almost yes. all the statistics work. Almost nobody's going to do the work to figure out a 20-year survival or a 10-year survival. So you're kind of guessing after that point. Yep. And then the other thing that you look at is something that's more similar to how much gas is left in the gas tank of saying, well, how long does someone on average drive before they're out of gas? the overall survival number. And again, it's a median overall survival, meaning the middle number in the, the list. Um, and that's usually in a number of months, but sometimes in years, hopefully years. Well, you know those two things and you know you're, you're kind of, now turn it back into a gas tank and you can kind of get a feel for what it is. It's not perfect. It's not, you can't really draw the whole survival curve out from those two things, but you can get an idea of whether or not, um, like if I tell you that there's a 50% chance of running out of gas in the next five, five hours, you go, okay, well, maybe I have a half tank of gas. Maybe I do. And I tell you that half the people run out of gas in five minutes. You go, oh, I get that. What's happening is I've got some people with a leaky gas tank and other people with a full gas tank. Correct. And that's a very different feel from if I tell you like the average time of running out of gas is five hours, then you go, well, you know, it's like, well, everybody lives about five hours or five years or whatever it is. I mean, that's so that the closer those are together, the more you kind of feel like you understood everything else and, and they're really far apart. Then you go, wow, it's, it's just the, the risks are very different. And now and I need to think about this a little bit differently. So those are two. And there's, sorry, there's one more. I, 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 if you can find, and you can't always find something called a lifetime recurrence risk, that's helpful also. That means, okay, if I survive five years, what's the chance that it comes back in 20? Now, that's not often done. Sometimes it is. Um, and uh, for mine, it's 7%. It's low. You know, like you survive five years. In fact, if you survive two years, the, yeah. it's the gas tank is is totally leaking everywhere or or it's fine <laughs> it's full that's my kind of cancer um well then i also know that i'm not really worried about it coming back it's not like prostate cancer which mm -hmm. is like well it's gonna get you eventually if you live long enough that's not my cancer it's just yeah. a very different risk profile. So sorry, I know that's, that's, if, if you're, if you're listening and you just don't know how, the, how these numbers uh, work, think of it like a gas tank and you probably will have a better intuitive sense about how things work then. I love the analogy. I, I was going to just say that I, I absolutely love the analogy. I think it's a phenomenal analogy. Um, it actually took me a good two years to figure out the third one you went to your lifetime risk of recurrence. And it took me a while and, I, and it, it's present in breast cancer, but I, I didn't realize how to do the calculation on it. And I think I finally understood how to do it. In my case, it's like the first three years, very, very high risk of recurrence. And then it like tapers. It never really drops to a low enough number, but it tapers and it's a flat line taper for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like in that way, it's kind of like uh, prostate cancer in that there is a fairly high lifetime risk of recurrence, but it's just if you live long enough. 
I, I prefer got... mine. I, I have to admit, Samira, I, I, I'm all for the just get it over with <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> well, trust me, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. This whole like six months of uh, scanning for the rest of your life principle is very daunting. And yeah. at some point, I don't know if you've gone through that, but for me, data was kind of my uh, my way of feeling like I had agency. So doing the math actually gave me some blitz of control, which is why I kept doing it. And then at some point, because at some point you're right, it's it's such a guesswork. It's an educated guess, right? But you don't really know because the data just doesn't, just doesn't exist. Especially if you come down to the true, true, true subtype of cancer that you really represent. If you really adjust for the molecular subtype and the biological and the age and the racial and ethnic, et cetera, et cetera, it, the, the true version of a cancer twin just doesn't exist. And when outside of that, when you're doing the math, it really is guesswork. And at some point, the, the scale tipped for me on the other side, where the lack of data began to actually cause me more anxiety and stress. Hmm. So it's just like this funny balance. And I've had to learn how to enter data in, into like PubMed land for a little bit and then back off because otherwise it ends up, it just, I just end up spiraling. And hmm. I've had to learn a uh, boundary setting in that way just with myself. But I don't know if, if you relate to that at all, but um, I'd love your reaction to when does data start to get uh, dangerous? Yeah, well, I mean, it's all already fuzzy enough that learning something a little bit more, it's not, well, I'm not even at decimal points at this point. I'm within 20%, like, I don't have the same uh, temptation, you know. There is no one ring of statistics that is um, tempting me to put it on because I know that the numbers are kind of crap. So it, it doesn't really matter all that much to me um, at this point. And um, I'm also lucky in a sense that there are a ton of breast cancer papers. There are so many breast cancer papers, gastric cancer. They're all in, you know, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. Uh, that that's where that's where gastric cancer is really done. There there are I when I looked up five year survival for my particular kind of cancer, I think I found two papers. So. Wow. That's just it, you know, yeah. not too much to have to deal with. It's, I, I always find it fascinating because we've had a lot of guests with a lot of different types of cancers come on the show. And that, that story of how much data exists, too little, too much, it is, it has such a dramatically different impact on those populations. Because the exact opposite is true for breast cancer, right? If you just look at ASCO from last week, just from last weekend. How many breast cancer papers were launched and how many abstracts and how many guidelines shifted? And we have now a new class of medications and metastatic settings that have now gotten downgraded to early stage settings. And you're like, that's just breast cancer. And it was a, a preponderance of it. So it really is, um, it always, it always gets me whenever I hear people talk about the, how much data exists and how that ends up driving both the psychology of navigating cancer, but also kind of how you make decisions. Yeah, and the, and the scarier part is that the data that are out there are not only fairly incomprehensible and poorly written, you know, just that is the nature of the beast. You just have to learn to live with that if that's if you're in molecular biology. But the ones that are well-written, compelling and comforting are all complete lies and are out there, I mean, not all of them, but you know what I mean? I like guess it's, it's the, misinformation sounds great. It sounds like they tell you what you're going to do. It's wonderful, 100% success rates. They spare you from chemotherapy. I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's gonna cost you $30,000 and you have to go to Mexico, but it's wonderful, trust us. I mean, it's, it, and it's, it's meant to be enticing to people yeah. who are at uh, a low point. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, it was actually one of the things I wanted us to talk about, because I think you, you quote this statistic, which is patients who resort only to alternative care have a double, like what, two X, right? Double, double the risk of death. Is that right? Am I quoting that is it right? correct. There are a couple of papers out on that where they've, um, they're both retrospective studies for obvious reasons. They're not going to, we're not going to randomize people and say, you get chemo, 
you get honey. Like that, that's not happening. I mean, nobody's going to do that, but you know, people are, uh, they, they do follow them based on diagnoses. And yeah, if you decide, I don't believe that stuff and I'm going for alternative therapy to the exclusion of traditional evidence-based therapy, you're more likely to die. Like twice as much is a lot. That is a lot, a lot. That's a curve that you can, you can plot out and you can just w watch that happen. It's one of the worst decisions you could possibly make. Um, of the very few decisions that are really out there that we as cancer patients have that we can move the needle. I mean, we can't, there are, there have to be very few places that we can make a decision where we get a drug that we wouldn't have been given as part of traditional therapy. Mm -hmm. That's better. I mean, yeah. uh, even the ones where we're like trying to be aggressive and say yeah. the, the, the odds are poor for my cancer with traditional Therefore, I want to try a clinical trial and have just a different risk profile, you know, yeah. just take a chance on something like that. Sensible decision for many people in many cases. Um, yeah, we can make that decision. But our oncologists usually are going to offer that anyway when they not 100 percent, but they often are going to offer that anyway. So, again, we're uh, by taking that decision into our own hands, by doing the research, we are putting ourselves at grave risk at, at times. And I, I, I wish it weren't so, but we're not living in a neutral information society. It, it's long been in the cancer world, fraud and, um, and quack cures and danger that's out there. But nowadays, that is, it's the majority of, if you go and try to join a Facebook group on cancer, the legitimate ones are sometimes one tenth the size of the ones that are alternative, natural yeah. healing ones. And um, I, I wish it weren't so that that in fact you could just work through things through a, a different way and avoid chemo and uh, and radiation and traditional evidence based medicine. It would be nice if we can. But the numbers say it works very, very poorly. And it's, um, yeah. I, 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 what can I say? No, I fully relate. Uh, I, I fully relate. I, I do want to sort of call out though, because our audience is very global, that the evidence-based methodologies are very US-centric. Yes. They still are. And there's nothing wrong with that because the FDA still does very heavily lead the world in the world of like drug approvals and making sure that treatments come to market that have hit a certain standard, et cetera. But that perception that uh, there are no alternative models that are good, I think is not what you're trying to say. I think but I'm just going to underline kind of the main point and the highlight that, which is it's at the exclusion of Western medicine. Correct. Right? It's at the exclusion of it where, where the sort of a really, really, really dangerous line sits. And there was one more thing I wanted to underline that you said is that we don't live in an information neutral world, that there is incredibly biased groups for a variety of reasons that are propagating their interests. And therefore the information you end up getting access to is naturally speaking biased. And then the burden on sorting through that information does end up sitting on you as an individual patient or your family or your friends, whoever's supporting you. And your oncologist becomes a resource to help make sure that you are at least cross-checking it, hopefully. But the burden ends up being on us, right? And that, I think, is one of the saddest parts of the cancer experience that I've, I've seen happen. And I've seen it happen mm -hmm. over and over again. I've seen it happen with incredibly intelligent individuals who have PhDs in a variety of different scientific fields. It's just it. there's this funny balance of like, how do you want to live your life? How do you think of risk? How do you think of quality of life? And then what treatments you end up resorting to? And I think that that um, framework becomes so complicated when you're living life on a day-to-day -day basis and when you are dealing with the toxicities of treatment because even western medicine is not toxicity neutral no. right? 
so it's one of those things where it becomes actually quite difficult to make decisions in that landscape. So. I think it helps to think through what biases exist in the US-based system. So there are some biases that used to exist that were pretty, um, I'll give you an example. Um, it used to be that oral chemotherapy was almost unheard of in the United States. And mm -hmm. injectable chemotherapy was very, very common. Infused chemotherapy was, um, was delivered through so-called buy and bill, which is the mm -hmm. oncologist would buy the chemotherapy and sell it at a markup to patients. And sure. that markup was extremely high and can be quite high under the, the rules that, that, that we have um, in the, um, uh, mm -hmm. for reimbursement at certain places. And I would talk to oncologists as part of my job and talk about some oral chemotherapy. And they would say in the US, oh my gosh, I mean, I don't, I really worry about the compliance of these drugs with these patients. It's, I, I don't know, I don't know. Again, this was about a decade ago. Talk to ones in the EU and they're like, oh, well, that's just great. And so mm -hmm. of course the, the patients will be compliant. It's a cancer, you know? And, and the, the difference there was, uh, was, was money, I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that, that's what it was. So there are places that have, and, and that's, that's a pretty egregious example, but one that, ex that did exist at one point and is less common now, but still does exist. What places do you worry that the U.S. system kind of gets things wrong? What are the biases that are there? The biases that are typically here are the bias towards um, treatment as opposed to no treatment or palliative yes. care or something like that. Yes. Um, all the incentives align for the oncologist to say, you know what, I really want to treat the patient. I want to, I, as an oncologist, don't want the patient to die. So I will treat. The, um, the uh, insurance companies are kind of neutral on this because the, even though the, they should really not want to treat the patient, they would just rather, they'd make more money or lose less money if they just let the patient die. There are laws that stop them from doing so. So... Yes that there's no break, there's no insurance company or payer break in the United States uh, or, you know, mm -hmm. de-accelerator on the system. So they're there. The hospitals have an accelerator on it because of treatment equals okay. um, revenue to them. Um, and people and uh, obviously pharma companies want to make money, so they're going to want to treat. And the papers that you see out there, so there is a bias in the papers of negative results don't make interesting papers. People don't like to make papers like that. Um, I guess the final one is that um, an expensive treatment is going to be tested more likely than a treatment. Like if, if I figure out in the kind of the classic in patents is if I figured out a brick could ca cure cancer, who's going to pay for testing the brick? I mean, you, could you get a patent on it? Sure. But there are a lot of bricks. So it's very difficult to get that. So you can see a bias in the papers. Now, those are all real. Those are not phony biases. But a lot of these biases are there in the U.S. So that what's the plus side of the U.S. system is that people go to prison if they lie about these things, if they lie about data. Yes. So you see numbers that are out there. You more or less trust that the numbers are generated fairly. Yes, there are biases, but they're not lying about the numbers. Now we switch to alternative care supplement therapy. Mm -hmm. Money is there and no one is stopping them from lying about the numbers or the stops are so pathetic that they might as well not exist. You know, they just put up shop somewhere else. They go and they give their treatment in a place where they can't. So you're completely, you've got all the real risks that are out there of people that want to make money and they just lie. And that, that it's, 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 it can be just, it's maximally dangerous. So, I mean, I, it makes sense to all of us to say that pharma companies are biased. They are. Yep. They're my clients. They are. It's, it's just how it is. They're there to make money and cure patients. I mean, it's not, it's not a pure, it's, it's not just pure uh, altruism out there. The others are there to make money and don't have somebody threatening to arrest them if they lie about things they don't have somebody checking their work it's just a completely different ball game it is the difference between um you know being cold because it's winter and cold because you are in outer space 
it is yeah. not, you, you're it, the the danger difference is as I said and we talked about twice. It is double the risk of going down this route, um, uh, and so evidence is is best. I guess also just one one point which uh, is helpful for XUS is that you are at least piggybacking off of not just the expensive treatments because we have guideline. Uh, which I, I know you've talked about in other shows, the NCCN guidelines um, and other cancer guidelines, because we have those systems in place, when there are data, even if they are for a brick that treats cancer, it gets in those guidelines. So you do have resources or ways to find out things that we know work. We have evidence these things work. It doesn't really matter to NCCN if a pharma company is making money off of it. They don't care. Is a bunch of doctors looking at stuff and saying, okay, this works. This has yeah. evidence. We believe it. So all of that is still available, even if the treatments are excessively expensive mm -hmm. for the new ones. There still are lots of data. There still are things people try. I mean, people try things and, you know, if they work, then they do end up in the guidelines. Uh, for for our audience, Jeff is referring to episode number five that we had with the head of the NCCN Foundation. Patrick Delaney, who talks about guidelines and how they came about and how it really is for a global audience. And it is free for patients on their website. So that's the episode that Jeff was just uh, referring to. Um, Jeff, you're totally right. I, I cannot um, express how grateful I am that you laid out the biases because I think the biases make the US healthcare system what it is, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't produce really good work. And Internally at Medicare, we, we have this debate all the time about incentives between insurance companies, pharma companies, patient advocacy groups, et cetera, and how very often the misalignment of incentives ends up causing a lot of the uh, issues patients end up facing. But I, I really, really appreciate you laying out the biases because interpreting information, understanding biases gets you, I think, to a better informed place because you can appropriately put the context on the insight you're generating from that data. Exactly the same thing is true for rigorous evidence-based data and for maybe not rigorous evidence-based data that is also published online that you're getting exposed to. So I very much appreciate you laying out the biases. Um, with that, I'm actually gonna switch hats a little bit. Um, so where we opened this uh, episode with was, uh, you are just someone with incredibly talented skills, everything from Jeopardy to being a playwright, molecular biologist, of course, of course, consulting for pharma, et cetera. But most recently, you've taken your experiences as a patient and written a book. And I believe you've dedicated that book to your family. I did. So I would, I would love to learn a little bit more about what made you write it. Um, and then the specific question I'm going to ask you is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you have seven kids. I do. And your book has a number of sort of life lessons, insights, advice for everyone. But if you had to pick seven of them for your kids, what would they mm. be? Sorry, I know a little bit of a loaded question, but I suspect, yeah. suspect you've been thinking about this already. I hadn't thought about the exact seven. Um, so I'll try to, uh, I'll, I mean, maybe I'll grab the book and try to uh, flip through and see which ones kind of come to mind. Um, why I wrote it, uh, th those seven kids, that that's the driver. Um, at the time when I decided to start writing, it was when I'd already had surgery. And it was then at that point possible, I, it, they, thought, they thought I had metastatic disease. And so that was the point where um, where they thought I had five months left. So in, in that case, I was really just, I wanna get these things that make life in general, not life with cancer, but just life in general into the hands of my kids if, in case I'm not there to help make life easier. They help yeah. uh, avoid, um, so, some of them help people avoid hard times or live through them. Even something as simple as um, get some sleep when things seem really dark. Just get a good night's sleep and it's not quite so bad in the morning. It won't be all better, but it'll be somewhat better, a little bit better. Um, just get, having that, that toolkit, that kind of mental toolkit in mind, um, 
helped me, you know, and I earned that through pain. Um, and I don't want my kids to have to go through the same pain to get the same learning. Um, let me grab a copy of the book and flip through them. But yeah, so there was that as being the, um, the, the biggest driver on um, why I wanted to, to, to write. My first thought was just get write those down. Yeah. But then the other thing I found, and uh, obviously you found it too, um, was that as I describe what was going on with my own cancer, I would get people on social media that, you know, friends, family, um, but friends that would say, this helped me understand my mother's cancer, my grandfather's cancer, and they did not want to talk about it. They didn't know what to say about it. They, okay. they didn't know it. Um, so seeing my reaction helped other people understand either their own, their husband, their wife, um, cancers, um, and those that, um, that, that were, had unfortunately died that of cancer. And, and that, then it became more of a, not just for my kids, but write something that could be helpful to other people and draw people through, through that cancer experience. So I went from diagnosis, um, uh, the surprise diagnosis of cancer. <laughs> uh, I hear it's always a surprise, maybe not so much for people with BRCA mutations, but for, uh, I mean, for me, it was, well, congratulations. I found it out by opening my medical records. Um, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, lost my train of thought. And then welcome to Chemo Brain. Um, yeah. Let me see, see some of the things. Um, so here's here's one. You can choose to see. So this is my book, uh, Living uh, uh, Father, mm -hmm. uh, Inspiration from a Father with Cancer. Um, you can choose to seethe over other success or warm yourself over it. Mm -hmm. That's something that as somebody who's um, self-confident to the point of arrogance, it can be trouble when you see people getting the success that you think you deserved, mm. that you wanted, but you didn't get, and they got it. Mm. And your, your reaction to that can be just why they haven't, and I don't have it. Or you can recognize that suddenly, you know, somebody who is, you can learn from, you can learn from their success. And they can potentially even be somebody who can help you get success that's similar to that one. Um, that, that's something that I, I don't know that you will always. Um, it, it's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap for smart people and, and, and people that are ambitious. And it's, it's, uh, it's one to know. Um, another one that I, I think is helpful and is not obvious at all, I think, um, is that when you have teenage, te do you have teenage kids? No, no I okay. have two dogs. Once and two dogs. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> possibly doesn't apply to teenagers, but the dogs you'll get with this is that teenage kids can act like pack animals. Um, mm -hmm. They, at some point, they cannot tolerate being dominated. Mm -hmm. So if you understand how dogs view dominance, you can understand what a teenager is going through. Mm -hmm. And you've got to, as a parent, decline those dominance fights. Once you realize that that's what's going on, that I'm trying to exert control because I need to be dominant, they're, they're going to bite you. <laughs> because they can't stand the leash. They can't. And our whole goal as parents is that we mentor our kids into making good decisions for themselves not to make the decisions for them. And if you have that, that switch in attitudes, that's one that I would want my kids to have that I, that I, um, I don't think is obvious. And you see a lot of people getting into that trap with that. Um, I, I don't want to take, maybe not seven. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, I think we're at we have a uh, good night's sleep. Yeah. We have uh, the pack animal. Yeah. No, I want to go through chemo brain. <laughs> But she goes away. <laughs> we yeah, have we had one success, success and ambition one. Yeah, that's three. Sure. So maybe um, more. Okay, sure. So, um, uh, propaganda victims are victims. Hmm. Don't blame victims. Propaganda works. 
you'll see it and you'll get very frustrated with somebody. How can they believe and just insert the thing? We live in a propaganda space. We do. And it's not just advertisements on television. Uh, you know, there are bad actors that are trying to change the mind um, and trick people into believing things that are to their detriment and wrong. Yeah. That So d just don't blame the victim. Just let that part go. And um, you can really act in the, the best interest of the person you're talking to, even if they're frustrating you, even if they're frustrating you great, greatly. Um, never, uh, never let the uh, tribe pick your truth. Let the truth pick your tribe. Uh, that's another one that can help you. Like if, if your group of people is telling you that you have to agree with something that's false, just don't play that game. Don't. Don't, don't, don't do that. Um, you'll, you'll be surprised to find that if you just stick with things that are true, as best you can figure them out, that you will just be drawn like magnets to the same place that there are other people that just believe the same thing because truth pulls people like a magnet to, uh, to it. You don't have to, it, people can feel alone if they don't know that somebody else is going to be there, that you feel like you're just leaving the world you know, but you're, you're not, you are, but there are people ready to catch at the other end because the truth is drawing them there too. I think I have two more. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Is that right? Is that two, yeah. two more yeah. down to there? Okay. Mm -hmm. I get uh, two more at this one. I'll get, I'll um, end with the last two in the book. Um, th this one comes from Buddhism. Um, Wish everyone well. If you just spend your time like saying, I wish you well in your mind to someone, even people you don't really wish well at, at, at the beginning, um, you, can, you can use that to feel better about yourself and to, and to do well by them. It doesn't mean if you wish somebody well that you do whatever they want you to do. Because sometimes yeah. what they want you to do is something that is wrong. It is bad for them, bad for you, bad for other people. In those cases, sometimes the best thing you can do for someone is to take away their power to do the thing that they want to do, but you still wish them well. Yeah. And then the point that I, I do try to, um, I try to highlight with my kids, my kids are smart. Um, uh, my kids are smart and I think they are beautiful. So I try to ingrain with them that it is nice to be smart. It is nice to be good looking. It is nice. Like a summer's day is nice, but that isn't what makes, that isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is being kind. Kindness at the end of the day is all that really matters. Oh, I love that. Hmm. So usually I try and summarize these episodes and synthesize everything we've spoken about. Um, this You're episode- good at it, but- <laughs> I was wondering if you were writing them down like as, as debate, uh, were you debate team? Were you like to try to get every piece of the argument or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I just have a lot of training at McKinsey. <laughs> yeah. um, so I usually try and synthesize it, but I was, uh, I was saying that this is a hard episode to synthesize because we really have, I think, as I suspected, um, gone through quite a gamut of different insights. So I'm going to attempt it, but you may have to help me on this one. Um, so I think we opened with the idea of time and what living means with uncertainty. So five months to 50 years. We then went down to calculating risk and just understanding the myriad of data out there and how wishy-washy it can be. And really, at some point, it is just a, a guess. We also spoke about how data can be a, both a support tool for some people, and then for others, it can be very intimidating and they may not actually have the ability to do it. And then in that situation, relying on your clinician and your oncologist to really help guide is sort of really critical. The onus sometimes does fall on you because of the way the healthcare system is set up. I do want to highlight one thing that we didn't spend a lot of time talking about, but I think it really touched me is it is on us as patients and families to give permission to the oncologist to be straight with us. I think that is such a profound insight and one that I don't think we talk about because our oncologists 
are at the end of the day incredibly human and they're there that they're, they're there to help you live the life you want but it's on us to tell them what we want so that onus is on us we then went on to talking about misinformation the biases in the healthcare system in the US but how if we as a society end up being victims to the propulsion of misinformation out there and end up making decisions there is a world in which our risk for death in the cancer world really does double especially if we don't look at true evidence based resources and treatment uh and that's when we went to your book and the seven insights you shared with us and i'm not going to summarize them but in our show notes we will summarize each of each of them and you can buy jeff's book by the way on amazon correct and any yes. any, any any store right barnes and noble etc it's all correct. available um so you can buy it and you get to see the rest of them we just got to seven um and i i really do want to thank you jeff um one is there anything i missed and two any parting thoughts anything that we haven't covered today that you like we should get this in no you didn't miss anything that i feel as though we must really must say so thank you for um um you know having a, a conversation that was uh, so insightful um and uh, it's it's great to to talk to someone who um who gets that and also um is able to think about how the cancer patient and the, their caregivers need to get information. There is one thing I would suggest, and this is especially true if you can't afford the book or the book is not available in your country. There is, if you Google my name, Jeff Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, -E and the, the letters N-P-R, um, you will find an article that I wrote, which is an excerpt from, from the book. This article helps you as a cancer patient and a caregiver figure out which new interesting ideas there are out there that have any relevance to you whatsoever because most of them don't most of the things that people talk about as being really new interesting cancer treatment cannot save you not because they don't work though they might not work but because they're far too late for you and for me yeah. It's the it's that that can materially help you because you will I, I I'm going to say with certainty you will get lots and lots of advice that is terrible from people that you care about and who care about you because they don't know better so they're going to give you information that is unhelpful and sometimes quite dangerous and there are ways then that that uh, this this article it's it's fast. It'll, it'll, it'll take you 10 minutes to read it. Um, it's one chapter from the book is the one that is the most, um, the most relevant to someone. If you've read nothing else in the book and you're a cancer patient or a caregiver, this can't help you. And it's free. We will link to it. If you send me the link, we can put it in our show notes. So absolutely do that. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate you coming on this episode. Um, thank you for sharing all your wisdom and your guidance. And I am so, so glad to have met a fellow scientist plus artist. It makes me very happy. Thank you, Samira. This podcast, show notes, and newsletter is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical advice, and no doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of information on this podcast or any materials linked from this blog is at the user's own risk. The content here is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.